development and the confirmation process is well outside the scope of this discussion. Um, so I'm going to point out a few principles to be aware of as part of this primer. Um, one of the most important things in preparing for the plan solicitation and confirmation process is that the debtor must be fully transparent with the court and with its creditors concerning its history, business operations, financial history, and projections going forward. And in fact, um, a Chapter 11 debtor is required to file uh, some form of a disclosure statement and a plan. Um, be, be aware that Chapter 11 plans include the concept uh, that there are different classifications of creditors. Um, some creditor classes are reported priority and um, the bankruptcy code certainly outlines um, how creditors are classified and who um, gets priority. So in a chapter 11 plan uh, situation, the debtor solicits votes on its plan from creditors and then moves the court to confirm its plan. The standards uh, that the court looks at with respect to plan confirmation are set forth in uh, the bankruptcy code and the rules, uh, specifically section 1129 of the bankruptcy code uh, contains the confirmation standards. Uh, once the plan is confirmed, the debtor is uh, post-confirmation and becomes the uh, reorganized debtor. Uh, thank you very much for your attention to this brief primer on the Chapter 11 process. Thank you, Kristen, and uh, appreciate the um, summary for the primer on Chapter 11. Moving forward to the next slide is uh, just a quick, quick review of part one of the program. Uh, briefly, just buzz through some of those uh, bullet points. All right, uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you again, Gary. Uh, hopefully everyone had an opportunity to attend part one of the program, which was held on May 28th with uh, my colleagues on this panel, along with Judge Latham. Uh, and uh, they did a marvelous job outlining um, subchapter five and these various topics in great detail. Uh, I'm going to just uh, do a quick review of what my colleagues and Judge Latham discussed uh, as a refresher. Uh, so that we're ready to have a more in-depth discussion uh, later in the program. Um, as a threshold matter, the provisions of Chapter 11 apply to Subchapter 5 cases, with some exceptions. Uh, some of those exceptions are going to be reviewed in detail later in the program, but I do encourage you to read the full text of Subchapter 5, um, and we've included that in the materials that are posted um, to the uh, San Diego Bankruptcy Forum website. Um, just briefly on eligibility of debtors to apply for subchapter five relief. Um, the CARES Act increased the amount of debt that a subchapter five debtor may have. The debt limit was temporarily increased to $7.5 million. The original was uh, $2,725,000. Uh, due to a, a sunset clause, essentially, in the legislation, the uh, $7.5 million debt limit is set to expire on March 27, 2021. Um, and presumably at that point, it would revert to the debt limit um, that was originally set of $2,725,000. I wanted to point out that there are new interim amendments to the federal rules of bankruptcy procedure, as well as new official forms, and those can be found on the court's website here in Southern District. Um, one of the key concepts in subchapter five is the difference between consensual and non-consensual plans. And it's important to understand um, the distinction when looking at many provisions that are set forth in subchapter five. A consensual plan means that all creditor classes have voted in favor of the plan. Um, and a non-consensual means that a, one or more classes of creditors did not vote in favor of the plan. 
Um, the confirmation standards, just by way of example, for consensual and non-consensual plans are different, um, and uh, those are going to be discussed in, in greater detail uh, later. Um, moving on to the role of the new Subchapter 5 trustee. Um, this uh, new Subchapter 5 trustee has uh, many uh, duties, um, and the key one is to assist uh, the debtor in possession in developing a consensual plan. Um, the trustee is going to attend uh, key court hearings, including the status conference that is uh, mandated within subchapter five and is also, um, as many of you know, part of our ordinary course practice in chapter 11 here in Southern District. Um, the trustee will also attend 341 hearings and the initial debtor interview with my office. Um, there are many other duties such as reviewing proofs of claim, uh, making plan payments in um, non-consensual plans, and uh, I refer you again to the text of the statute which is set forth in the materials for a full review of what those duties are. Um, an important point is that the Subchapter 5 trustee is to be compensated under Section 330, and that is different, of course, than other trustees uh, that serve in our bankruptcy system. Um, that's uh, probably going to be developed um, as time goes on. It's simply too early in the scheme to look at what that's going uh, to mean uh, for the debtor in possession. Um, moving to the Subchapter 5 plan, there are many differences between a Subchapter 5 plan and a classic uh, Chapter 11 plan, and I'm just going to hit on a few of the highlights. Um, no disclosure statement needs to be filed in a Subchapter 5 case. Uh, the caveat, though, is that the plan itself does need to include um, classic disclosures, including a history of the debtor, liquidation analysis, and projections. Uh, be aware that um, debtors are required to pay future earnings and income into the plan. Um, one very important point that I believe will be discussed later in the program is that there is a new provision for treatment of non-purchase money junior liens um, that we don't see in classic chapter 11. Um, in short, there is an ability to cram down uh, non-purchase money junior liens in certain situations. Um, for example, if the debt was incurred in the course of the debtor's small business at issue. Um, I'll leave more discussion of that topic for um, my panelists. Um, and just to wrap things up with our review, uh, on plan performance, we go back to, and in administration issues, we go back to the distinction between consensual and non-consensual plans. Um, when a plan is uh, consensual, uh, uh, the trustee will only make the first payment and then the debtor will uh, take over. Um, when a plan is non-consensual, the trustee will be charged with the task of making uh, those payments. That's uh, just one example of um, one of the differences in plan performance and administration. Uh, so that wraps up our uh, brief summary of my colleagues' uh, initial presentation, and we look forward to um, finishing this up for you today with our part two. Thank you. And thank you, Kristen. And before we jump uh, to the uh, continuation of the program, I just wanted to present uh, just a couple of important points. Um, we talked before about the payment protection plan, and it was uh, amended uh, by what's called the Paycheck uh, Protection Plan Flexibility Act of 2020. Um, if I said payment protection plan, I meant paycheck protection plan. And just the highlights are identified in the slide in front of you. Maturity date was extended from two years to five years. The effective date is as of the CARES Act, and it applies to prior as well as uh, subsequently approved loans. The period which it covers is now extended from June 30 to December 31, 2020. And the origination of the covered loans is extended from eight weeks to 24 weeks after origination or or 
December 31, 2020. And the, although the interest rate though still remains the same and um, uh, the borrowers now have five years to repay the loan, um, uh, oh, and send it to which we've talked about. The next couple of slides are just uh, amendments or additions to the uh, PPP, uh, which were not included in the original act, but I presented them just so that you could have them for your familiarity and review if the situation arises. Okay, moving past the Paycheck Protection Plan and going forward to, um, I'm gonna ask Diane to talk about one of the premier changes as a result of the SBRA, which is the Haven Act. <clears throat> and Diane, would you please discuss that? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Gary, and thank you to all the attendees who are sharing their lunch hour with you, with me and you. So the Haven Act was enacted at the same time as SBRA. It was August 23rd of 2019. One difference between the Haven Act and the SBRA was that it went into effect immediately. So as of August 23rd, uh, this is the law. And it was a bipartisan bill. It stands for Honoring American Veterans in Extreme Need Act of 2019. And what it does is it excludes certain military income that's related to a disability of some sort from the means test and from the current monthly income calculation. So the effect of it is to give it the same protection as social security benefits. So I think this information is extremely important for debtors counsel out there who are both calculating um, income perhaps in a chapter 13 for what the commitment has to be, whether it's three or five years, or also whether um, a particular client is gonna qualify for a uh, you know, chapter seven filing. Um, prior to the bill being uh, put into law, all military disability pay did need to be included on both Schedule I and in the means test, but this is obviously a major change. So for cases filed after August 23rd of 2019, you do not want to include that income. Service members who have some uh, disability or condition that's related to service are evaluated and then assigned a disability rating. And that scale is anywhere from 10 to 100%. And I've seen people with you know, a 10% rating, only a part of their check is attributed to a disability, but I've also seen people where 100% is. So um, if you're representing debtors, you're gonna need to get a hold of their pay advices and those are generally coming from either the Department of Defense or the Department of Veterans Affairs. And um, in addition to benefits that just the service members receiving, there can be benefits that are also exempt that are coming to surviving spouses or other family members. So if you're looking at this slide, there's kind of a whole range of of different benefits which might be excluded from the calculation of CMI, current monthly income. So disability and death benefits, monthly compensation for catastrophic injuries or illnesses, any combat related special compensation, disability severance pay, and um, also, also retirement benefits uh, oftentimes have a portion of that benefit attributable to a disability. So the practical effect of this, that's kind of what I wanna spend the most time on, is if your client is receiving income from the DOD or the Department of Veterans Affairs, you wanna spend some time on this issue, get a hold of the paychecks, talk to your client, and um, be, be concerned about what portion of the income should be included in the CMI calculation and what should be left off. And, Mary, do, um, do you want to give Mer us an example? Yes, Meredith, could we have the slide with the um, the paycheck on it, please? It's the next slide. Oh, there we go. So um, to the attendees, if you look at the left side of your screen first, this is the means test um, page that was modified 
subsequent to the enactment of uh, the Haven Act. And you can see that paragraph nine specifically tells you to do not include um, any pay um, received from the United States government in connection with a disability, combat related injury or death or death of a member of uniformed services. The next sentence is thoroughly confusing, but I, I will explain it to you on the next slide. But what it's basically saying, if you received any retired pay, then you're gonna have to look at that retirement pay and determine what portion of it is just purely retirement pay and what portion of it is actually attributable to, to the, the disability or the, uh, the, the service-related condition. So I did include on this slide, if you look at the right side of your screen, this is an actual pay stub from a former client. Um, they did qualify for chapter seven, but my means test would look completely different if I filed for this person now, because this was pre-Haven Act. But if you look at this particular service member's gross pay, you'll see that it's $2,002 per month. But on the next line, you'll see VA waiver. And that number is eight, I don't know if you can see it, but it's 1840.48. So this person has a pretty high um, disability rating, uh, more than 90%. So that's the portion where it says VA waiver that is exempt from the CMI calculation. So when you do the math on this particular client, although he receives 2002 per month in retired pay, most of that is related to a, a service connected disability. So the only portion I'm putting on the means test is the difference between those two numbers. And in this case, there are some other deductions here for uh, payments he's making, but I would only be including $161.52 on the means test. Now, the prevailing view from the research I've done is that you do, however, want to include the full gross pay on uh, Schedule I. So the, um, that doesn't change the disclosure of income on, on Schedule I. You do want to include it there. It also does not have any impact on 707B3 calculations. So the trustees could still evaluate this case for dismissal under the bad faith or totality of circumstances test. So it doesn't get you out of that, that scrutiny, but it, it will help you on the means test and uh, it, it may help your client qualify for a seven or perhaps have a lower applicable commitment period on a chapter 13. Um, so again, in a chapter 13, this could change your commitment period from five years to three years, because obviously it might be quite a bit less income. And uh, the other thing you might wanna look at is if you have a client in a chapter 13 case and maybe they're having difficulty making the payments, if your person is an active or retired service member, you might wanna look at that means test again, because the other prevailing view out there is that this probably can be applied retroactively to cases filed before August 23rd of 2019. And the, that's because the legislative history on this is pretty strong that this was to correct an obvious inequity in the law. For example, you know, why are we protecting social security and not you know, disability pay for service members? So the, the commentary out there is pretty much unanimous that this possibly could be applied retroactively to a case you already have pending. So again, I think just to wrap up, if you've got a client who has uh, military related pay, spend some time on it. Um, it could affect their ability to file a chapter seven. It could also affect the uh, commitment period for a chapter 13 case. And that's it for me, Gary, thank you. And thank you very much. It was really helpful and I appreciated the explanation of the pay stub and how it really applies, how you really apply the Haven Act. Uh, <clears throat> moving forward to the next slide, talking about discussion points regarding the subchapter five plan. And Kit, you wanna jump in and give a little conversation on that? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so this slide, and thank you, Gary. Thanks, everybody, for attending. This slide here shows the, um, the plan requirements for subchapter five. And there's not a disclosure statement requirement as there is in regular chapter 11, unless the court orders otherwise for cause. And so what you see here are basically the three requirements um, that must go into the plan. And uh, supplant the disclosure statement requirements. So uh, chapter 11 practitioners are gonna find this a very much more simplified procedure uh, for, uh, for getting their client through subchapter five. Uh, chapter 13 practitioners on the other hand might see um, the, uh, all the disclosure requirements as being a little bit more burdensome. Uh, there are quite a bit. Um, that you might want to check out, for example, on the court's website, there's a, a form for uh, individual Chapter 11 debtors that I think is uh, very helpful and that would obviously need to be tailored to subchapter 5, but it gives you an idea of all, the dis of all the various things that would go into the plan in addition to these uh, three, um, these three uh, bullet points here. And one of them that I want to focus on here is those projections there that, that go into the plan. Um, those are probably something that you'll want to uh, work out with your client uh, sooner rather than later. Maybe even at the intake stage, you want to be asking people, what is your plan going forward? We know that there's a lot of distress out there with COVID-19 and uh, businesses uh, slowly reopening. So, but what is the plan going to be? And what do your projections show or, or can you give us projections at the outset because if the projections are not going to be fruitful in terms of showing what can be done in the future then um, this may not be a case that you want to take on as a, a chapter 11 as Kristen mentioned there are a lot of uh, aspects to chapter 11 that are fairly complicated like uh, use of cash collateral is just one so uh, you're going to want to make sure that this client is going to be able to um, have some means out of, of bankruptcy and, and also, um, uh, to, to put it sort of crudely, for paying you. Um, you know, how is this going to work? You're going to probably want to see those projections. If the client, uh, uh, obviously this year's projections are going to be somewhat useless. And so you'll probably want to ask what their profitability was in 2019 and see if those can be projected forward in some kind of meaningful manner, taking into account slow business at this time uh, to see what can be done in order to maintain uh, normal business operations, pay rent um, and uh, pay secured creditors and um, maybe return a dividend to unsecured creditors. Uh, the next bullet point there is uh, um, something that AJ pointed out, which is that in Chapter 13, there's not an or there is an automatic right to dismissal, and that is not the case in Chapter 11, including Subchapter 5. So, having a conversation with the client at the outset about uh, some of the risks of Chapter 11, including possible conversion to Chapter 7, is something that uh, everybody will want to take into account. Um, and then that other bullet point down there, this is what. Um, is probably going to be of very much interest to a lot of practitioners here. Um, this is an option that's not available in regular Chapter 11 or Chapter 13, which is modifying non-purchase money liens on the debtor's primary residence. So that's a big, um, big bonus in Subchapter 5 there. The caveat is that the loan had to have been used primarily in connection with the small business of the debtor. and Whatever that means um, is going to be open to a lot of, I think, uh, interpretation, maybe stretching. If a debtor got a HELOC, for example, a home equity line of credit, and then use that money uh, in connection with the business, would that apply? Uh, the, the lender might say no, uh, because I think that a lot of those loan documents contain an express uh, representation by the debtor that they're going to use it only to improve their their residents. So we'll we'll see how all that shakes out, but that's that's a, a big advantage of subchapter five right there. Hey Kit, so yeah. if if you're a debtor and you're borrowing money against your residents and that question does come up, how do you how do you how would you answer it? How would you answer how proceeds from the loan are to be used? 
Well, um, you mean going forward, they're not in subject, not in chapter 11 yet, and right. they kind of want to get some direction from you as to what to do. Um, you know, if I think if the if the loan documents are saying, and and, and you'll probably always want to be checking loan documents uh, before going into these cases like that. If the loan documents say that the proceeds have to be used in connection with the residents, um, you probably don't want to get them into too much hot water with the lender. However, I mean, what if they change their mind later on and, uh, you know, circumstances sort of warrant that they use that money in order to, uh, you know, keep themselves in business or do something and they kind of feel like they, they circumstances change from the point at which they first took out the loan. I mean, is that loan fraud? So um, there's all sorts of permutations to this uh, test down here used primarily in connection with the business, small business of the debtor that are, I think are going to really be a whole wide range of possibilities that uh, can come up and be litigated. And I think that the lenders will probably in most instances be, be motivated to prevent modification of their loan, which can include all sorts of things, stretching out of payments, a lower interest rate, or even uh, a bifurcation between secured and unsecured status. And I think that lenders are gonna be motivated to avoid that. That was helpful, thank you. Yeah, um, so then moving on on this slide, uh, without an absolute priority rule, how will unsecured creditors be protected? And um, it, so, so recalling for, for a minute that the uh, absolute priority rule uh, requires in regular chapter 11 that uh, at least with respect to unsecured creditors, that equity holders can't retain their interests if uh, non-consenting impaired classes of unsecured creditors are not paid in full with interest. And one of, the, one of the big benefits here of subchapter five is that you can, equity now can retain uh, their interests without having to satisfy unsecured uh, classes of creditors in full. So then how are unsecured creditors gonna be protected? Well. Maybe, maybe now the liquidation test kind of finally has its day, um, kind of comes to the forefront. And um, this is one place where a subchapter five trustee or, or maybe an unsecured creditor would question the debtor's liquidation analysis and the market values given to the debtor's assets in that liquidation test. Um, usually, I mean, in my experience, it hasn't really been a big issue in regular chapter 11 because we're always trying to grapple with the absolute priority rule. And if unsecured creditors are going to be paid in full as a result of that, then the liquidation test becomes less important. But here, um, because of the possibility or even maybe the probability that unsecured creditors are not going to be paid in full and that they might be paid very little dividend uh, this liquidation test might give uh, creditors or the subchapter five uh, trustee an opportunity now to maybe boost that dividend to credit unsecured creditors by questioning the uh, the values and the uh, debtors um, uh, debtors analysis. Also, um, the determination of disposable income uh, can that be questioned? Certainly. If you've got an income statement in front of you, I I, I think, I, and I've been to Chapter 13 creditors meetings where I've heard Chapter 13 trustees kind of try to wring a little bit more money out of the debtor. Um, maybe this is going to happen here in Subchapter 5, where somebody tries to wring a little bit more out of uh, either the individual business debtor or the corporate uh, entity debtor by questioning some of these items on the bat on the uh, income statement. Um, are, are salaries too high? What kind of, you know, what, what is this travel expense line? Maybe those have to be brought down in order to uh, provide a better uh, dividend to people. And, and uh, it also, there is that strange uh, three to five year range um, that has to, that's part of the fair and equitable test. Um, but the, uh, but the subchapter five doesn't really give us any guidance as to whether it should, under what circumstances should it be three years or four years or five years. So I think this is probably a place for some judges and maybe the subchapter five trustee to sort of advocate for a little bit of discretion. If uh, unsecured creditors are just not getting much out of a three year plan, then, then um, it may need to then be boosted up to a five year plan. 
uh, in order to, on the other hand, if, if the plan is providing maybe an 80% dividend over um, you know, three years, will that be enough uh, to satisfy that test? Or are they gonna say, well, if you could do 80% in three years, maybe you could do 100% in five years. So um, that'll be a really interesting uh, place to watch. I have a feeling that most of them are going to turn out to be five-year plans. Uh, maybe some principles of chapter 13 will be incorporated, or I should say imported over to this point um, when it comes to individual debtors. And um, that, that's all I've got on that slide. Thank you, and AJ, don't wanna leave you out in the cold. We're gonna <laughs> discuss a hypothetical. Um, and the hypothetical really discusses what if the business owner is late in his payments, let's say three months late, and he's really trying and the landlord's getting very frustrated and finally issues a three day notice and um, files a UD. Tell us what happens. So, so thanks Gary and thanks everyone for, uh, for participating in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, first, this is a really interesting state law bankruptcy crossover issue. So you, you do need a little bit of background on unlawful detainers in order to really understand what's being, uh, understand the nature of this question. And so with, with that, you know, we have to understand where we are with the unlawful detainer courts right now. And, and as we all know, the courts were frozen for a little while. They opened up, I think it was last week. And some cases are moving forward, some aren't. Uh, for unlawful detainers right now, um, there are definitely rules at the California level and the local level, which you need to understand in terms of when a landlord can properly evict in light of COVID. And so that's well beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about here today. But if you are in this world where you're managing landlord tenant situations, you need to understand both the local level and the state level rules for residential and commercial, because there are distinctions there. But beyond that, the, the base level problem that you have as a landlord is the judicial council has said, we are not going to issue any summons on UDs for three months after the end of what's called the emergency order. And that's the state of emergency declared by Governor Newsom. So um, what that means is right now, the expiration date is set for June 30th. Um, there, uh, so that means that for in order to, to get a summons on a UD, you really need to expect what June, July, August, September 30th would be the earliest that you can expect to do that. There was some discussion about moving that date closer, I don't know if that's forward or backwards, but it, moving that date closer to the current date, but that was uh, received a lot of uh, negative feedback. And so they are keeping that. It's also possible that the uh, state of California extends that date. So uh, the emergency order might continue as they have been doing uh, periodically, depending on where the numbers are. So, I mean, that's just the basic primer on the state law side of things. And you need to be familiar with that. But for the purposes of bankruptcy, the question becomes, do you have a valid lease to assume at the time that the bankruptcy is filed? That's the, that's the legal question that needs to be answered before you can understand how to analyze the lease. And, and the reason why this is important is, and, and as my colleagues have probably heard me say 20 times already, is, is the hardest hit industries uh, from COVID are, are these front facing businesses. And, and most of us know them as, as restaurants and retailers, but you know, you can go down the list from, you know, hair salons to, to dry cleaners. Um, there's, uh, they generally involve people walking into a store and they have large investments in their leases. So they've made m major capital improvements. They have long-term leases. There's personal guarantees. There's a lot. And simultaneously to that, without a location, they don't have a business. So this is, I think, the core business that's going to be um, addressed with a lot of these subchapter fives that are, uh, are, are going to be filed. Um, and in order to start, you need to understand, do you have a lease? And if you don't, then is there a possibility of reinstatement? And, and that starts with an analysis of, of uh, CCP 1179. And so 1179 says, effectively, hey, lease termination doesn't happen upon a judgment for possession. It doesn't happen upon the sheriff knocking on the door. At least termination occurs upon at least, and this is, you know, Windmill Farms is the seminal case for bankruptcy on this, but the it happens at least at the time of the expiration 
uh, uh, either the expiration of the three-day notice or at least by the time the UD is filed. Um, so it, it, assuming that the three-day notice to quit, uh, to pay or quit is valid. So in order to understand those things, again, you have to understand the basics of uh, evictions and you have to be in the lease to understand what are the termination provisions of that lease. And, and I've seen a lot of different things in there. Really, you just have to sit down, read the lease, understand when is this lease terminated because that's what's gonna determine. If the lease was terminated um, at the time of filing, you've got a lease assumption issue because you don't have a lease to assume. And that's what Windmill Farm says is, hey, look, you know, there is this concept under 1179 known as equitable reinstatement. We can reinstate the lease, then potentially assume it. And some of the boundaries around what constitutes a proper equitable reinstatement, they're a little bit finite, but you know, by and large, you know, if you read the cases, and there's some in that link below that talks about this, but um, I hope I'm not going too long here, but um, if you read the cases, then um, you, you really do see that, I mean, a COVID-related default uh, would likely qualify. And, and again, I, I would encourage you to, to, to read some of the articles that, uh, that, that read that article in the link below that, that splits that hair for us. But one of the things that you need to do in order to reinstate under 1179 is you have to make full reinstatement or full payment of any past due rents. Um, and so you might be in a situation where you're saying, hey, let's go file for bankruptcy and reinstate the lease and you know, maybe we can amortize the arrearages, but if you don't have a lease to reinstate, assuming the three-day notice has been properly issued and it's, the lease has been terminated, you're gonna have to pay full value of the lease uh, before you can reinstate and assume. So that's a step one. And then you, you, you go into step two of the analysis, which requires assumption. And assumption is, is typically going to be 120 days after, within 120 days of filing. But in order to assume the lease, um, it requires that the debtor cure any defaults um, and uh, provide it, or provide assurances that it will do so promptly. And it also requires that you provide assurances that you have the ability to pay. So again, you have both of these things coming together uh, for, for 1179 and, um, and, and 365 in order to reinstate a lease and in order to assume a lease. So um, those are, I think, some of the contours of, of a lot of the cases that we're gonna be facing. So if you're advising clients in this environment, I mean, a best case scenario in my mind would be, look, you're, you're gonna have to come up with some money to, to, to reinstate this lease. if, if you want to proceed um, because without that, um, you're not going to have a business. Thank you, AJ. You know, we've been talking about this from the debtor tenant perspective. What if the debtor is a landlord? Uh, what's what's your thoughts on that, Diane, AJ? How, how do you perceive that? Well, um, well oh, go ahead, Diane. I'm sorry. Oh well. I, I guess we can both speak, but uh, I've had a couple clients call me uh, who are presently in chapter 13 cases and their plan payment was calculated based on rental income, projected rental income from a tenant, either in their own home or a rental. So in both cases, the client, the debtor is saying, you know, my tenant sent me a letter saying they have a COVID-related hardship and they can't pay rent. And then on top of that, I'm hearing from AJ that even if they get a UD mm -hmm. filed, they may not get a summons issued for, for several months. So for those clients, I'm looking to a possible modification under Section uh, 1329, and this is way beyond our scope today, but just to let everyone know, uh, hopefully you do, that uh, Section 1329 of the Bankruptcy Code has been amended to provide that debtors who do have COVID-related income issues, they can seek modification after, after hearing a notice to extend their plan payments for a seven-year period with the seven years starting at the time they first filed their Chapter 13 case. So, so far for these clients, the only real relief I've been able to offer them is to say, hey, we might need to go in on a modification and get you more time to pay because they can't afford to make the full plan payment without the rental income. AJ, what do you think? 
I mean, this is more related to the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, let's, I, let's, move on to, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, because I think we were talking a little bit about this, and and maybe not even the next one, but there's yeah. one later. But like, you know, from a oh. landlord's perspective, you're 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 really thinking about um, how do you work with a debtor um, or a tenant? Let's call it a tenant. Forget about a debtor, because you're gonna be thinking about you know what is your vacancy rate like? What's it gonna be like filling this space at? Where are my personal guarantees? So I mean, these are some of the things in addition to the potential for bankruptcy that you're thinking about as you go through this is, is how do you, how do you analyze this from the landlord side? And it's as much a market analysis as an understanding of basic uh, bankruptcy rules. Well, let's, let's look at that next hypothetical and Kit and Kristen, your points of view as well. You have a struggling restaurant and they've only returned to 50% 50 capacity. What's the impact of that on feasibility uh, under subchapter five? Uh, Kit, what do you think? Well, uh, yeah, there's there's a big impact there on feasibility. We don't know necessarily from uh, the fact pattern here um, what the business's profitability was like pre-COVID. Um, and so cer certainly revenue down 50% is right there a, a problem, especially if they have very thin profits to begin with. Um, and we don't know what the uh, what this restaurant's uh, debt load was like or secured debt load because under a uh, subchapter five, uh, you, you, the, the absolute priority rule is is still intact in so far as um, debtors have to pay uh, secured creditors in full uh, with interest, and um, you know they they can do some things to modify that and make it a little bit easier, um, but uh, well, again I. I What's the impact on disposable income? Well, um, 1191D2 kind of shows, you know, down there is the business's profit. Uh, 1191D1, I think, is probably looks familiar to Chapter 13 practitioners for individuals. And, and D2, whether the, uh, in, whether the debtor is an individual business or an entity business, there's, that's the profits that have to be paid into the plan over three to five years. It, it may be that um, it could be a, end up being a 0% plan to unsecured creditors. But um, the, this, this business still has to make enough money in order to um, sh demonstrate that it can continue in operations, pay its trade vendors going forward, because you, you kind of wonder, I mean, how it's going to do that um, going forward if it couldn't do it before. It's got to pay its uh, business operations, its rent, which... Um, judging from the last slide, could end up being a burden on the estate because those are gonna have to be cured. So there's gonna have to be some cash in order to do that. But um, the, those are all things that are gonna go into feasibility in those plan uh, projections, which again, give another really important reason to probably be looking at those projections sooner rather than later. Uh, and, and looking at those projections, it's really important since you really can't make any utilization of going forward projections uh, on a 50% revenue basis. You have to look at <clears throat> what the debtors or the business operated in 2019. What were the static expenses? What were the ongoing expenses? And formulate your projections almost in a blind, um, utilizing past um, financial information. Um, um, it's going to be a very difficult challenge to uh, provide that as part of your feasibility. In fact, I saw today that 24-Hour um, uh, Fitness uh, was one of the companies filed the Chapter 11, and it hit right on what you said is they were barely making it before COVID-19. And I think what's going to happen is companies that were a very thin profit margin before COVID-19 are not going to come out of it and you'll see them either in a chapter seven or a, a chapter 11 and a mom pa conceivably in a sub chapter five um, so i think that's where this is going to be headed um, if we wanted to then talk about on the next slide some final considerations um, uh, lease review and review of loan documents um, something we were talking about before you need to check to see what your default provisions are, uh, any modifications. Um, and did I miss a slide? No. Um, and 
working with your, your vendors and your customers, your upstream and downstream uh, clientele and, and uh, vendors. Um, understand if there's rent, re rent reduction or forbearance provisions in your lease or your, or your lender. And the big, the big ticket item is communication, is you really need to have an open dialogue with your uh, lenders, with your landlords, with your vendors, with your customers, because everyone's on the same page. And uh, I think to me, the key word here for other considerations is ongoing communication uh, with the industry people. Um, and moving finally to the last slide for other considerations, um, AJ and or anyone want to jump in and talk about input um, from you know a landlord's perspective, or what you do with your landlord? Yeah, and I think this touches on what we were saying earlier. From the landlord side, you know, you you need to understand what the market for your property is going to be post COVID. And I, I think as bankruptcy practitioners, we're in this very unique situation where I think we're the only attorneys that are comfortable with Excel spreadsheets and numbers. You know, like okay, well, what does what does your vacancy rate look like? What is your post market? Is this a is this a retail space or a, a restaurant space that? really is going to just have a glut of inventory post COVID. And you know, if, if that is the case, then you need to really think about how do I work with this person to try and get them to a point where they can be successful rather than, you know, destroy and start over. You know, is there value in the lease by itself? This is also another topic that comes up. You know, there's a lot of leases that were written 10 years ago with, you know, four, uh, five-year extension options and, and the lease itself is outdated and the value of the lease itself even in this market still has value so you know you, you the personal guarantees these are all things that you need to understand uh, when you're making a decision as to whether or not to terminate a lease to really regain possession and start over with a new a, a new tenant and then uh, Kit how about dealing with your lenders well um, yeah uh, there's so one of those bullet points is um, the interest rate to be applied with respect to secured lenders. And um, if you're, and, until uh, that Supreme Court case that you see there was a Supreme Court case decided under Chapter 13 that made it very easy, for, I think, for Chapter 13 practitioners in order to, to, to pick an interest rate um, because it was a formula based on pr the prime rate plus one, two, or three extra percentage points. And uh, that was a chapter 13 case and chapter 11 practitioners, I think would probably like to try to import that reasoning into chapter 11 cases because it's so simple and it'll keep litigation costs down if you can do it. And I think that there's some ninth circuit precedents indicating that it <clears throat> might be allowable, but it's not a foregone conclusion, I think in my mind. And so you, you still have to kind of be prepared um, to look at the interest rate there and, and be prepared if you're representing a, a secured creditor be prepared to contest the interest rate and start bringing in the other analyses and other uh, approaches for uh, determining the cram down rate of interest in a chapter 11 case. Thank you. Um, well, we're approaching the bewitching hour. Um, and do any of the panelists have any uh, comments they would like to uh, conclude with? Kristen, AJ, Kit, Diane, any closing comments? Crickets. Um, I don't see that we have any questions and answers. Um, we'll remain on the line uh, for a couple of minutes if anyone wants to submit any Q's and A's. Uh, actually, if one came in, let's see what we got. Marty Elopoulos, under SBRA, professional administrative claims can be paid through the plan instead of on the plan effective date. So won't feasibility necessarily include the ability to pay forward, pay allowed administrative claims for professionals? If so, any pro forma projection should include a line item for payment of those claims. It's a good point. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. It's usually, it's usually measured. You, you do have to take that into account in regular chapter 11. The difference there is that administrative claims must be paid on the effective date of the plan. And so you're always having to put in the disclosure statement and analysis showing that the debtor is going to have enough cash on the effective date. Here, if you're going to proposing to pay administrative claims over time, is absolutely right. You still have to go through the analysis and show that it can be done. Okay. Um, I, I think the good news is, is that, that admit those, those admin payments 
I think um, the way I read the statute can come out of that three to five years of, uh, of uh, profit payments. And so theoretically, those should be paid off the top by the subchapter five trustee. You know, and, and I re this is a little bit off tangent, but it deals with administrative claims and, and fees of professionals. There's a decision that came down today called In Ray Penland Heating and Air Conditioning out of the Eastern District of North Carolina, where a chapter five trustee uh, tried to retain counsel in a quote, very routine manner. Uh, and the uh, court rejected it saying as providing the code only under unusual circumstances. So in terms of administrative claimants and, and professionals, um, chapter five trustee is gonna be only able to retain counsel under unusual circumstances uh, as an administrative claimant. Um, Todd Guerin asked, uh, as to the amendments to the CARES and P Act and PP loans, the regs still disqualify debtors. Um, that's, Todd, if I understand it correctly, um, there's litigation on both sides of that in favor of the SBA and uh, in favor of borrowers. And um, uh, there's a case pending now uh, in the Southern District uh, that our office is handling called Vestavia. And uh, that matter is gonna be before Judge Adler on a preliminary injunction motion. Um, so um, not sure how this district's gonna go, uh, but there are pros and there's cases in favor of the SBA and in favor of the borrower that the um, disqualification language should not be um, applied. And then Mike Burkhold asked, how many chapter five cases have we seen in San Diego? There was one, but it was dismissed. Um, it was filed by a pro per. Um, so I don't believe, Kristen, you can jump in. I, I haven't seen any since then, have you? Uh, I don't believe that there's been any um, new subchapter five cases. Uh, I, I haven't either. Um, one question from a couple more minutes from Bill Smelko um, talks about that the federal judgment interest rate is 0.17 percent. Uh, will that help in a subchapter five? A any thoughts on that? Well, uh, it it could help. Uh, I Usually a low rate of interest like that is relevant to the cram down rate of interest for unsecured creditors in regular chapter 11, but, but here I'm not so sure. I mean, right now, all you, have to, all you have to do, I mean, you have to satisfy the cram down rule with respect to secured lenders, but as to unsecured cred creditors, as far as I can tell, all they get is their pro rata share of the three to five years of, uh, of uh, plan payments. And, and, and that leads, thank you for that. And that leads to the next question from Richard Garber. Can a plan exceed five years to help keep the payment down? Um, the code says three to five years. Uh, Kristen, what do you think? Uh, uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, I'm not seeing any support for exceeding um, five years under subchapter five. Well, uh, I have a feeling maybe he's talking about with respect to secured lenders. Uh, you, those should be uh, spread out, you know, 20 to 30 years or as long as, you know, you possibly can. But unsecured creditors, that, that fair and equitable test with respect to that unsecured class of creditors, why would you want it to go any longer than five years right. if you're the debtor? And uh, finally, from Michael Halloran uh, to basically AJ, quickly, does CCP 1179 call for immediate payment in order no. to get relief from forfeiture? statute doesn't exactly say that what do the cases say so the statute calls for uh repayment over a reasonable period of time um but my understanding i, I don't have the case citation but when i was reading the cases on this uh, my understanding was that you did need to pay it in a in, uh in order to prevail on the 1179 motion or you need to be able to show that you could pay it really quickly it is an equitable statute there's going to be a lot of a wiggle room on there. But the flip side to that is, is there's 365, which requires payment uh, uh, in order to assume, and that payment must be made promptly. The, the arrearages have to be cured promptly. But Michael, I'll, I'll, I'll dig up that case and, and uh, I'll forward that over to you. And if anybody else wants it, but I, I, I do remember reading a case on that that said, hey, you know, you have to substantially cure in order to have this motion granted or be able to show your ability to do it very, very quickly. 
And the last question uh, is from uh, Athalia uh, Magana. Uh, and this is, I guess, to Kit. Can you, or, or, or Kristen, can you briefly describe the difference between consensual and non-consensual plans? Well, a consensual plan is where all classes of predators have voted in favor of the plan. And a non-consensual plan, simply put, is where you have um, one or objecting uh, classes of, of predators that have not voted in favor of the plan. Um, there is a, if it's a consensual plan, um, confirmation becomes much easier. If it's a non-consensual plan, then the can still confirm, but uh, needs to look at um, some standards like um, fair and equitable um, in order to confirm. The goal of the subchapter five legislation was to try to achieve um, consensual plans where possible. I, I think most of our discussion here today is kind of assume that the plan would be non-consensual. If it's consensual, that's that's great, good for you. If it's non-consensual, then you have this fair and equitable test that kicks in with respect to the three to five years of disposable income that needs to be uh, put into the plan. So we, we've sort of been assuming that it's it would be a non-consensual plan, which I think the vast majority will end up being. Okay, well, I think that uh, concludes the program. I uh, thank you, uh, panelists. Thank you, Meredith. and. The secret code, uh, which I promised you at the end, is S like Sam, B like boy, R like Robert, A like Apple, the number two, S B R A two. And uh, you can send it, your request for the uh, certificate to the SD Bankruptcy Forum at gmail.com. That's SD Bankruptcy Forum at gmail.com. And again, thank you for the sponsor, San Diego Bankruptcy Forum. and. Uh, panelists, as well as Meredith King, who did a tremendous job in putting these two programs together. Uh, thank you. Be safe and uh, uh, good luck. That's it.